Hello, and welcome to the live Impressions Group webinar, Ramp Up Social Media Without Ramping Up Expense, sponsored by RICO. I'm Denise Gustafson, Editor-in-Chief of Wide Format Impressions and the Editorial Director of the Impressions Group, and I'm the host of today's event. In this time of economic uncertainty, you may be looking for new ways to boost your shop's marketing efforts and to keep new projects coming in. One cost-effective and simple approach is to build your company's social media presence. So in this webinar, you'll be able to gain insights into why and how your business can use social media to market your services. You'll also get best practices and campaign ideas, as well as information about free tools and automation tips to help you maximize your social media presence. Now, before we get started, let me take a second to point out the Tips for Attendees widget on your console. It's the blue one with the wrench on it. If you missed the Tech Tips video we played leading up to the webinar, you can always click this widget for more information. And also, we have time built into this webinar for a question and answer session at the end. So feel free to submit your questions throughout the webinar. So today we have three speakers here that will discuss how to build your company's social media presence. We have Stephanie Deppa, who's the Director of Breakaway Communications, Steve Marr, Chief Relationship Officer with Supplier, and Ken Stellan, he's partner and EVP of Corporate Development for Frontline Performance Group. So Stephanie, I know we have a lot to cover today, so I'm gonna turn this over to you to get us started. Great, thank you so much, Denise. Um, so we'll be kicking off today with a quick, a quick intro to each of the speakers here. So first off, uh, my name is Stephanie Deppa, and I'm a director at Breakaway Communications, which is a public relations uh, agency that specializes in technology. I work with B2B and B2C technology companies on social media, media relations, and other communications activities. Um, and I also support and manage the social media presence for Rico's production print channels. So if you are following Rico Pro Print on any platform, uh, my team and I work on that every day. My name is Steve Marr. I am the Chief Relationship Officer at Supplier. We are a marketing services and communication company specializing in critical communications for critical mail space. Simply stated, that means we are really good at putting out letters every day with extreme SLAs. My background spans a lifetime in print. Um, I don't want to say how long I've been doing it, but I've been working in a print shop since I was 13 years old. Um, I've seen the good times, I've seen the bad times, and right now we're in an interesting time. So I want to thank all of you for making the investment to learn and to continue to improve yourself. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Steve. My name is Ken Stellan. I'm an EVP and partner with FPG, the Frontline Performance Group. We help firms with service-based sales management. We also have a technology platform that helps them with their guest experience, customer service, and overall ancillary sales programs. I've been with the firm for 20 years now. In my current role, I help our digital media efforts. I see our strategic content, and I work with our partnership group on thought leadership. And I'm looking forward to spending some time with you today on this. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, so why are we here today? As Denise said at the top of the call, um, we put this webinar together knowing that during this challenging time, um, we're all looking for new ways to help to boost marketing efforts and um, keep new projects coming in. And one simple and cost-effective way to do this is to build your company's social media presence. But why? So using social media enables you to build community and trust in your shop's expertise, and it allows you to tap into bigger trend conversations and ultimately to find new customers. And it can be done at little to no additional cost. So in today's virtual world, customers, both your present customers and your future customers, really rely on word of mouth and look to social media um, to learn more about every possible service that could help their business right now. And by leveraging social media, you can position your company as a resource to these audiences 
demonstrating your expertise and capabilities on these social media sites where they're already spending most of their time, and doing so in creative and engaging posts that take little time and practically no budget to create. So today we're going to talk about all of this and more with some real life examples from Sapire and from SPG. But first off, we wanna focus on the general principles of social media, why it matters now, why it's a great tool for this industry, and how to get started. Then we'll talk with Steve from Sapire so that we can hear firsthand how his company is utilizing social media. And we'll close out with some tips on what to keep in mind when setting up and communicating via social media, including automation tools, how frequently you should post, and campaign and post ideas. All right, so I'm going to hand it over to Ken and he'll get us started. Thanks, Stephanie, I appreciate it. So building upon the why mindset is when I think of social media and I see some of the best firms across the world do it very well, is you really start to think about the human psychology of it. And you always hear how humans are addicted to their devices or how we're addicted to different social media. Well, there is the psychology behind it. And of course, I'll hit on in my piece, uh, the psychology of influence. And there are six principles of influence that have been tested over time. And the, the main expert on it, if you will, who founded this area, his, his name is Robert Cialdini. And some of you probably heard his name, but there's three of the six that I really believe that tie into uh, how to be effective in a product or services environment, especially in the print and wide format area. And it's really social proof, authority, and likability. And I'll hit on those in a moment, but I believe what you can do is leverage the psychology and be more influential out there via different social media platforms. The other piece, too, in your world now, whether you're independently owned or you're part of a corporation, is that personal branding and professional brands, I believe they're interrelated. You could have a great company and you spend a lot on culture and you spend a lot on employee and employment and branding, et cetera. But if your team, whether it's an entry-level employee or mid-level management or senior leadership, they don't have a good personal brand about them, it affects the company brand. So I believe now more than ever they're intertwined and social media is a way for you to take back that impression space. And then the two sort of are pragmatic. The final two here, it's a very controllable medium. Wherever you're at with uh, President Trump or wherever you're at on that spectrum, he does use social media as a direct message to his audience. And I'm not saying good or bad or indifferent, but that's an example of not only him or other politicians or celebrities, they use social media as a direct form to really talk to their end customer or audience. And, and, and that's what's changed certainly in the last 10 to 15 years. And anybody can leverage that, whether you're a small independent operator or you're a Fortune 100 organization. And then today in the unfortunate situation, more eyes are on our screens than ever. And even prior to this session, we learned that more people will be on this webinar because their thirst for knowledge, because they have more discretionary time. The more people are on their devices more than ever because they're in this sort of state of flux. So that's another reason to the why behind it. But in a moment here, I'll talk a little bit about some specific examples and how you can leverage. I'll talk more specifically to LinkedIn and Instagram per se. Steve has some really great content on the, those platforms as well. But when you think about authority, you're really thinking about not an authority of somebody who is in law enforcement or a teacher or a disciplinarian, but somebody who's a subject matter expert, somebody who's considered an authority in their respective space. Uh, likeability is creating a connection. And the important thing with likability, it's not the fact that somebody else likes you or an organization likes you, it's the fact that you show that you like them. And so likability is that connection we have with an end customer or a prospect. And then finally, social proof. It sort of goes to the adage, um, birds of a similar feather flock together. Well, we are tribal in a way where we flock to similar minded or like minded individuals and groups. And Social proof and consensus really does that. And we'll, we'll highlight some different examples from LinkedIn specifically. 
So before I go into it, let's just talk a little bit about LinkedIn. I am a huge fan of LinkedIn. I wish I could say I was an early adopter of it. I don't think I was late to the party, but I reflect on our organization and the different platforms that have had a positive impact on our business and our brand and, and even our team members. LinkedIn is by far, it's in the top one, two, or three. And so many of you know this, but from a high level, it's the world's largest professional digital network of over 640 million people. Um, there's about 90 million of them that it's been found that they are senior leadership, so they're senior leader decision makers. And there's about 300, and a little over 300 million active monthly users on it. Now, why I'm very fond of LinkedIn is because I believe it's the most credible platform out there in the sense that, number one, Microsoft owns them. We all know that Microsoft is not going around any time, not going away anytime soon. And certainly the other piece with it is there's many pieces in LinkedIn that control spamming or controls anonymous contributors. So if you take a Twitter or even take Facebook, there's probably millions of different types of profiles that are anonymous profiles. In LinkedIn, you can't really hide behind anything. So it does add a different semblance of credibility to the platform. And I believe if you're distributing your message through a platform that's perceived in a credible way, it only helps the strength of your message. So, but with LinkedIn specifically, we have found that it's really your living resume. So I have a, I have a lot of friends, maybe they're not directly in my professional network, but they say, yeah, I signed up for LinkedIn many, many years ago, but I never use it. I'm on there, I have a profile, but I never use it. And the one thing I share to them about their personal and professional brands, while they should at least be aware of it, is by just setting up a LinkedIn profile, let's say your name was John Doe, and you set up John Doe and you set up your company name, all of a sudden, just with that, because LinkedIn is so well optimized on Google and the different search platforms, all somebody has to do is type your name into a Google search bar, and even with an incomplete LinkedIn profile, or a profile that wasn't well thought out, or worst case scenario, it's not updated, you're still gonna, you're still gonna index higher because of that. So I always share to people, it is a living resume, and it's not just on the profile, it's a living resume because it allows you to share content, it allows you to share the things that are on your mind professionally. Um, for me personally, uh, I've become much better at curating online content and different things that I'm working on. But I find for me, curating content on LinkedIn is much easier. It's if I can go back, because I have a pretty active thread, or my posts are pretty consistent, or articles that I might have contributed are pretty consistent, I can go back one or two or three years to sort of see, okay, what was on my mind at that, that time period? And so, I find it's a really good resource for that. And then just like, you know, how people get information off of Twitter or they get information off of Facebook, I find for me LinkedIn is a very good knowledge hub. And my, my um, feed is, I'd say it's very well calibrated to the type of information I wanna take in that applies to my professional setting. From a marketing standpoint, so we just talked about what's in it for you and, and, and from a high level why LinkedIn matters, but I guess from a business standpoint, especially in your world, the commercial print world, from marketing, it really lets you establish your presence and expand your presence from afar. And if you think what marketing is, at the very core of it, it's taking a brand or product and making it placed in somebody's mind, even when somebody's not there selling it, or there's not an advertisement, or maybe even when the brand isn't, or the product's not in the market yet. But it's making your presence felt, and LinkedIn does a great job of that. And then the other piece, LinkedIn, and I think Steve will talk quite a bit to this with his organization, but it definitely lets you punch above your weight class. And, and that's what, when I think of the importance of authority and subject matter expertise, by leveraging LinkedIn to show what you know about your product line, 
or how you use your respective equipment, it really shows that you could be on the same page as a multi-billion dollar corporation or even a corporation that's publicly traded. It really lets you share your knowledge in a deeper way than most platforms do. So let's talk a little bit about why it's great for your industry. I'd say number one, you're in the visual industry. So um, not only can you control your message as I alluded to earlier, but it's a great and very easy platform to showcase whether it's a new product that's coming out of your, your business, whether it's video or really well done stills or even still images that are just taken off your phone. It's just a great platform for that, as is Instagram, of course. It's also a great platform, getting back to that authority standpoint, you are in a craftsmanship industry. Even though the equipment is multi, multiple millions of dollars and there's a ton of tech behind it, there's still an element of craftsmanship and pride of work behind it. And I believe LinkedIn helps you showcase that. And this is a great example today, but good businesses do business with good businesses. You know, winners partner together, and it allows you to showcase some different strategic partnerships. And like everything else, this sort of gets to the personal branding, how they're intertwined. Now more than ever, work-life balance is intertwined. I mean, we were talking before this call about how when you look at it in this new environment where people are working from home, you're pulling back the curtain on what their work life looks like. But LinkedIn, it doesn't always have to be your nine to five content. For example, if you're an alumni of a university and you're passionate about that university and the good work they're doing, you could share that. Or if you're involved with a nonprofit that might not be affiliated with your work, you can showcase that. So it's not just about the typical nine to five business content as well. So let's share some best in class examples. Now, I want to share some examples. We had clients all over the world with FPG. We have clients publicly traded, Nissan, Hilton, Marriott, Europe Car. They're, they're all over. But one of the companies that I became more, I guess, familiar with was through a non-professional or formalized relationship with some of the work that I do in the community with a nonprofit. And I saw that they do a really nice job with LinkedIn. So I knew this was more of the wide format world, so I figured I'd highlight them. And so the company's called Team Concept. They're uh, based in Carroll Stream, Illinois. Uh, they've been in business, I believe, over 20 years. The principal's name is Tony Rouse, and uh, their head of sales, his name is Mike Such. So um, he oversees strategic partnerships. But what I want to do very briefly is highlight some posts that they've shared that ties back to that authority, likability, and social proof. So um, these are some, and by the way, I asked them for permission for this, but here are just some examples of authority, and anybody could do this, but uh, I know Mike is specifically focused on keeping tabs on how um, digital printing and different print avenues have, can impact marketing campaign. So he shares some really good stuff for the Wall Street Journal, Ad Week, other organizations as well. Uh, Tony Rouse, the post on the right, is an example of authority. And when I say authority, that's, yet again, that's somebody who's really fine-tuned and focused on developing their subject matter expertise or their deep knowledge of an industry. And so here's an example of, um, I believe, Tony reshares and or posts a lot of industry information from NAPCO as well. So here's an example of uh, some different marketing strategies. Um, getting back to authority too, in craftsmanship, I saw this one from Mike's a while ago. This was specifically, they were highlighting a product, um, a piece that they did for a client and the level of craftsmanship behind it. I think this was a gift card uh, that they ran. And you see the image on the right, just to go a little deeper on it, you can post up to nine pictures on LinkedIn. Now, there's a lot of different theories on how many you should post, but I believe getting back to you're in a very visual industry, you have products you can show, you have your services you can highlight. If you have good quality imagery, show them. And so this was an example 
a really good example of what I saw uh, on Mike's feed recently. Um, this is another one. Let me let me talk about likability. So there's those six principles of influence. We're talking about authority, likability, and social proof. But I, I believe likability it's it's really it's present when you're talking about nonprofits and community groups. And this is a great example. I, I think many of you know of this nonprofit called Mission 22. It's an incredible veterans group and team concept they support many different nonprofits, and that's how i sort of became um, affiliated with them but team concept they really support mission 22 and here's a sample of what they do in their community and some of the things that have come off the presses and it's not just team concept sharing it but there's been many times nonprofits have also shared that this is what team concept has done for us so it's a great way of showing that you have that social common connection and I will say to this, I mean, there's hundreds of business owners on this call. Just think about all the times you've helped your community, and you're not being too self-serving, but it's okay to really highlight what you've done for your community. And I think LinkedIn, if you do it, you do it judiciously, it's a, it's a good way of sharing that as well. Um, I put this post in. I just put this in from a credibility standpoint because I am a practitioner of it. We have a marketing department that's mindful of it we set content calendars but this is one of our larger european clients and it's jet 2 uh, they're a large tour operator but they're in the uk and this was something that i put out there saying that hey in this time where there's a lot of tough press and scary news here's a great corporate example of a corporation stepping up there's obviously stories in the press about how they're delivering food to elderly and how they help rescue some uh, school-aged children who are stranded abroad. But the far right image shows the expanse of it, that 13,000 people viewed it. But what was more important to me is that 400 people from Jet2 saw it, over 400, and that about 20 people reshared it. And we're talking C-level executives, our main client liaison, et cetera. So that's an example. Here are, here are two others. This is that social proof piece. Is good businesses do good work together. Uh, this shows a strategic partnership that team has set up recently with RICO. Um, the image on the far right is a commitment uh, that Tony, what Mike shared with me, their commitment of investment in this time, what they're doing to partner with RICO. That's a video image that's actually embedded there too. So they have some real high quality RICO imagery in there as well. So how you get started with LinkedIn. Uh, specifically, establish your profile, that's step one. Then build off your company profile if it's not already set up. Then think about the audience, engage your audience on the, engage your audience on the, who you admire, who you wanna show that likability to or other associations, and then develop a message cycle. So the cycle being how often are you gonna post? I try not to post more than 12 times a month. And um, and what I want to be very mindful of posting. And then learn off LinkedIn. Try to find best practices from different industry pros you're working with. So that's my initial piece on it. I'll, I'll now turn it over to Steve. Uh, I know he's got some great content as well. Thank you very much, Ken. I feel like I'm standing on the shoulders of giants after hearing you go through your speech and your part. Um, to simply state where we are at, I want to set the stage a little bit. I want to explain how Sapire leverages social media and what we were faced with from day one and how social media has helped us solve for those problems. First of all, who is Sapire? Sapire is a communications distribution company specializing in com complex compliance-driven solutions. We are a technology forward company focused on delivering automation solutions in a highly secure environment. Our multi-channel communications services include printing, mailing, fulfillment, and electronic delivery. Now that's a mouthful. Simply stated, Sapire manages, produces, and mails compliance-driven materials with complete transparency, accountability, and reliability 24-7, 365. 
to understand further what our challenge was when we, when we set out to build a business, you have to understand that Sapire is a restart organization that opened its doors on May 17, 2019. I say restart because we are a combination of over 100 years combined experience in the compliance critical communication space. When we opened our doors, we had zero clients and we had a substantial portfolio of new equipment, including the first commercial installation of a RICO VC 70,000 inch at web. Right now, I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, holy cow, a startup, who on earth does that, right? We agree. Um, we knew it wouldn't be easy. It's being compounded right now with everything we're facing with COVID, but we still knew we had a strong business model. Supplier plays an extremely narrow market. We are a niche performer. We speak solely to people who have critical communications needs. That means the healthcare space, the limited retail space, the FinTech space, and some other isolated spots for loyalty programs. When we're out calling on clients, our competition is deeply entrenched. This goes to what Ken said about being able to punch above your weight class. We are competing with organizations that are publicly traded, have great reputations, have good solutions, and have solid relationships. To compound that challenge, our sales cycle is long, sometimes 12 to 18 months. We are selling a very complex product into a very, very narrow space, as I said. On day one, as a company, no one heard of Sapphire. We had zero brand recognition. We needed to solve this. As a leadership team, and again, this builds on what Ken said, we all had unique brands. We had all been leveraging LinkedIn for years. We have all curated content. We have all spoken with a different voice of authority. We were all in the same space, but we all had a different impression of that space. We needed to pull all that together and quickly get to market on May 17th. What was social media's immediate value to us as an organization? Well, first of all, speed to market. Think about that. On day one, using this relatively cost-effective tool, we were able to quickly establish a presence with limited effort. When I say limited effort, we all had existing LinkedIn profiles. We had to establish one for supplier as a brand, and we were able to do that quickly and efficiently. We sought to immediately establish ourselves as thought leaders in our, in our preferred social channel, which is LinkedIn. This goes back to the earning credibility, which Ken mentioned. We needed to get out there and be a voice in our industry. We needed to show our clients that not only did we understand their space, but we could play in it, again, punching above our white class. We needed to have an understanding that the length of our sales cycle was a limiting factor to our immediate growth. We sought to follow our clients and our prospects online day one. We wanted to be engaged with them. And more importantly, we wanted their information to be a constant source of information for us in our daily feeds. So we followed the brands we wanted to call on and partner with. If we were focusing on a Fortune 100 company, we followed them. So every morning when we came in and opened our computers, we could see if they posted something relevant. We could respond to that post. More importantly, we were able to engage with that post. Utilizing social media, we were able to quickly promote the supplier brand at scale. Before social media, that wasn't possible. Today, it allows all of us on this call to be able to quickly get to market, promote ourselves in a way we want to be seen, and again, be in touch with people we want to be in touch with. The very, very first thing we did when we were talking about our social media strategy internally is understanding that there are four big social media channels out there that are available to all of you. We looked at our clients. We quickly established that our clients do not participate on Instagram. Yes, many of them have presence on there. Yes, many of them have feeds on Instagram. But the executives and the stakeholders we were looking to engage on 
were not being a voice on Instagram for their brands. We also decided as a company that Facebook, while it's viable to follow your prospects and your clients personally, it is not something that we really wanted to pursue for a corporate branding initiative. Our clients do not look on Facebook to find a secure communications provider. Instead, for the reasons Ken mentioned, we focused on LinkedIn. The people we wanted to engage with are on LinkedIn. The people we want to engage with are on LinkedIn daily. The brands we want to partner with are also active participants on LinkedIn. Then in the upper left, you'll see a small little heart next to Twitter. While Twitter to us is not a viable source of leads or revenue, it is a source of branding. We do use Twitter. Um, we make daily tweets. Most of our tweets are linked to our LinkedIn profile. Again, we use that channel for branding, not for revenue generation or lead generation. So our LinkedIn strategy was simple. We needed to promote the supplier brand. We needed to establish our leadership as thought leaders. We needed to reach prospects through our sales team. We needed to engage target companies through supplier and engage prospects through sales and leadership of supplier. The first thing we needed to do was basically akin to herding cats. As I said early on, all of our sales reps and all of our team leaders and all of our executives had long curated and extensive histories on LinkedIn. We all had different brand personalities. We all looked and felt different. The first thing we sought to do was standardize that. We created a standard design template for our brand identity that we all followed and we all executed. That includes the header bar. We wanted to make sure that when someone looked at Michelle's LinkedIn, the graphics matched what they saw in Jason's. They want to have instant brand recognition and brand credibility. That all tied into the supplier corporate LinkedIn site. Again, our goal here was to create brand uniformity to make sure the voices we had promoting supplier were all aligned in not only their thought and their content, but in the look and their feel. This exercise also went into the primary text blocks on supplier. While everyone has a slightly different take on the corporate culture and what we do, it is all unified. We want it to be able to speak with a common voice, but voices that are unique to each team member. Talk about thought leadership. Obviously, our founder and CEO, Michelle Steinberg, is the power behind the supplier brand. She is the one that is out there constantly creating thought leadership by her writing, her posting, and her blogging. We develop a cadence for her to where Michelle posts and writes at least one article per week, and that is also tied in to our website through our blog. Michelle also shares content two to three times per week as available. Michelle spends time daily commenting and liking our prospects and our clients post daily. This sounds quite arduous when you think about it, but we're gonna get into some of the tools and tricks that she does use to make sure that we can maximize her activity on LinkedIn. For the supplier brand page, whenever Michelle posts something or writes something, we share it, we put it out there. Whenever a sales team member posts something on there, we share it through the supplier brand. We are constantly sharing new content on the supplier brand site. And again, the supplier corporate side is also commenting and liking prospects posts daily. The goal here is again, to create a unified voice for supplier and to establish ourselves as thought leaders. To that, here's a, two examples of posts that Michelle's made in the past couple months. Obviously, the writing takes effort. Um, the writing is not easy, but the but when she does post something online, it is relevant to the markets we play in, as you can see by these two examples. The first is obviously relevant to, the, to today. We want to talk about how do we reach and communicate to customers in time of need. Right now, we're seeing a huge reduction in direct mail. 
We're all suffering from digital fatigue from staring at our screens, oftentimes in a laundry room, a bathroom, or at a kitchen table. The last thing we want to be able to do is go online. Michelle shared her thoughts about that and talked about how direct mail is still a viable, viable option for communicating with your clients. The second post I'm showing is a little bit more in the weeds. Um, would you pass a HIPAA compliance audit? audit? Obviously for us, we play in a very secure channel. While this message may not resonate to 80% of the LinkedIn market, it resonates to 100% of the prospects we are targeting. Again, the goal here is to establish ourselves further as thought leaders in our space. Now, some of the obstacles. Um, right now you're thinking, I'm sure it's, holy cow, how do I do this? There's not enough time. I've got a printing company to run. I've got clients to see. I've got other things to do all day long. Correct. Content. We're printers. We're not copywriters. How do we build consistency? And more importantly, how do we track ROI? These are all the challenges we were faced with and we had to come up with solutions for. First, the time. Um, it is an investment time. We've, we've automated a lot of our posting to use a tool called Hootsuite. Um, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, so forgive me. But Hootsuite is something that allows us to write articles, put them in a queue, and have them publish on a regular cadence. So that way we can allow our team members to write content, have content reviewed and edited, and put it out there. And if we write an article today, we can set a schedule that says this is going to be posted a week from today. It's already out there. It's pre-done. So that way when we have a half hour of free time, when we have 20 minutes of free time, it's easy for our leadership, our sales team, or anybody to go out and write a quick article, look at it, get it reviewed, and put it in the queue for future publishing. Content. We don't have enough time to develop content ad hoc. We have to develop a schedule. What we did is we created an internal spreadsheet that is a shared document between everybody. We look at it for it as an editorial calendar. It's a simple Excel. We go in there, we write down ideas. What do we want to talk about? What are we talking about this month? What are we talking about next week? We jot notes in there. It is a collaborative environment to where our executive leadership team can say, I'm seeing something, I want to put something out again about why. I then go in and distill that list down, look at it, start thinking about what we can do and how to build that content around that schedule. Also, when content is not available, as Ken said, we repost industry and thought leadership all the time. Um, we borrow information. We, we comment on information. And again, we do that through Hootsuite. So if we see something we like, we will repost it. We will share it. Because again, offering our opinion on a well-written article establishes us as a thought leader. That's what we want to leverage. We want to leverage what other people write that is relevant to our, to our clients and to our business. Building consistency is a big thing. Um, you know, we wanted to eliminate any obstacles we could. Our Hootsuite is a big investment in that um, solution. We want to stay engaged with our team. We make sure that our team is engaged. And, you know, in my role, I make sure that Jason and Mike post on a regular basis. I make sure Michelle is following her thing. We stay engaged and we build consistency. When Jason puts something out there or Mike does or another team member does, we all like it. We all celebrate it. We all share it. We put it around. We make sure it spreads virally. So we do build consistency in that way. Tracking ROI. Um, this is a big thing for a lot of companies. If I'm investing an hour or two hours a week, what is my payback? Am I going to net new clients from this? Am I going to get prospects? In our case, we made sure that we clearly understood what we were tracking, and we made sure it was measurable. In Supplier's case, we had a goal to increase our brand recognition. We had a goal to increase connections. Um, you know, do those connections turn monetary? Can we monetize them? Eventually, yes. But right now, the KPIs we're tracking, the number of new connections, the number of likes we get on an article, the number of comments. So whereas they are not hard dollar figures, we're seeing our engagement, and that's what we're choosing to track on right now. You know, looking for content. I'm going to come back to looking for content. Um, a large source for us beyond Michelle's writing is our partners. As Ken said, Rico has some great articles out there um, and some great posts. When we see them post something, we oftentimes share it, we'll add our comments, and we'll really help promote that. 
Rico is a leader in our space. We understand that. We look at our industry, and we have a couple sources which I'm going to share with you. One of them is a is an email and a website called Target Marketing. I get a daily email every morning in my inbox that has at least three or four great ideas that I can share with my clients through my feed. Of course, when I'm sharing, I also offer my opinion. Why is it rele relevant? Why do I like it? Make sure you add something to it. Finding content also means from your clients, your industries, and trade associations. If you see a prospect posting something, we oftentimes go in, repost it, reshare it, and add our thoughts around it. We are getting ourselves known to our clients and our prospects. Industry and trade associations are a great way to build credibility too. We're all calling undefined markets, be it retail, be it university, higher education, whatever. They all have trade associations. Make sure you leverage the writing found within those. Lastly, there are a ton of smart people on LinkedIn. Every day I open my feed and I am amazed at the content I see coming through. The past month and a half, I have seen nothing but a lot of inspirational quotes about selling through challenges, about optimizing your time, about making the best of our encouraged staycations that we're now under. I share those posts. I promote those posts. I want to be the voice of calm and I want to be the voice of positivity. So look for other people on LinkedIn that are smart and have good writing styles. It's okay to share those posts and more importantly, to celebrate them. Here are a sample of three of the content tools that I use day in, day out. Um, I subscribe to something called Owler, which gives me an overview of all the companies that I'm following. I go on every morning, I get an email from them, all the companies that I want to prospect, all the Fortune 100s, all the people in my space, it gives a quick recap in there. I can share content from that. In the middle is what I mentioned earlier, target marketing. A great source of daily content for anybody that puts ink or toner on paper, anybody that does mail. Target marketing is a great source of ideas, very, very well written and very, very well curated. Lastly, this is an example of an industry newsletter, um, Furious Healthcare. We play in the health, healthcare vertical, as I mentioned. This is a daily, weekly digest I get that has stories in there about our clients or about the industry. I like to curate and share content about our history. What is going on? What am I seeing? What is the CMS changing? How will that change impact my clients? What solutions can I deliver to my clients that fit in what the industry leaders are talking about? These are three examples. Another example is Google News. Type in your vertical, type in your industry, type, type in your target clients. You will find a wealth of information and it's okay to share. We get content from where content is online. Lastly, I wanna talk about some tips, um, some lessons learned from a lifetime of being in print and being in sales and being on, on LinkedIn. First of all, be yourself, be authentic. Um, this is a time to really build your personal brand. If you read my profile, there is a little bit of humor in it. There's a little bit of a snarkiness in it at times. That's who I am. Anybody who knows me knows that I am sometimes a little bit of a smart ass. My LinkedIn profile reflects that. Make sure it's your, yourself, it's your voice. One thing I see too often appearing on LinkedIn is political. Don't do it. It's not worth it. You're going to isolate and alienate half of your audience by making the wrong statement. I like to tell my team members, Facebook is for political, LinkedIn is for professional. It is a very, very slippery slope to go down. Even when you see an article that might resonate with you, by liking it, you risk alienating half of your audience. We use LinkedIn to educate. We don't sell on LinkedIn. We take the selling offline. We build a connection. We look to establish and connect with people that we want to be partners with, and we take the selling offline. LinkedIn is a tool. Connect, connect, connect. Find people you want to partner with. Find people at your target clients. Build a connection with them. My one word of advice is a lot of experts say a lot of things about sending a note, sending something, um, 
that gets into a bit of information paralysis, in my opinion. If you want to connect with someone, send an invite. Don't overthink it. You don't need to add a note, or maybe you do, but don't overthink it. Just connect. Then once you connect with someone, make sure you say thank you. Make sure you take it offline. Don't be a stalker. Nobody likes stalkers. But make sure you acknowledge that this is a professional connection. Follow people. Follow companies. Follow content. Continue your education cycle. Engage and be an active participant. Don't be a stalker on LinkedIn. Sit there. If you see something smart, engage with it. React to it. Comment on it. That is building your personal brand, even if it's not related to your industry. If you see a smart tip on gardening, make a smart comment about gardening. If you see something about an industry that you follow, engage with it. Lastly, and this is probably most important for everything, you need to build a strategy to turn connections into prospects and prospects into clients. Otherwise, you're just wasting your time online. If you find someone you want to connect with and you make the effort to connect with them, turn them into a prospect. Take the conversation offline. Send them a note. This is not a game of seeing how many people you can connect with or how many connections you can have. This is a game about building relationships, just like in sales. Right now, you need to take these social media contacts and make them personal. Offer a phone call. Send them an email. Do something. I know right now no one wants another Zoom call. Do not ask for a Zoom call. But make sure you take it offline and make it personal. And with that, that's what I have, and I'll turn it back over. Thank you, Steve. Um, so we're going to continue with a few more tips for everyone. Um, so as you can tell, this group is definitely a big fan of LinkedIn. Um, but we wanted to encourage everyone to really focus on one channel to begin with. And as Steve mentioned earlier, um, before you start moving on this, Take a minute to think about where your prospects and your customers are. Um, you know, are you working within some of those niche industries uh, the way that Steve is? Are you working more with local uh, businesses and organizations and schools? Have a think about where your customers are and where will be the best place for you to connect with them and find them on that one channel to start with. I like to borrow from one of my favorite Bill Murray movies, What About Bob? It's all about taking baby steps. <laughs> so from there, once you know your one channel, um, try to post once a week. Or if that even seems like too much, um, try once a month. Um, you have to start somewhere, and no one's going to be an expert right out the gate. Um, but you do want to start getting consistent with the things that you're posting and when you're posting. But again, baby steps, try once a week, see if that's something that you can keep up. Um, to help you do that, also as Steve talked about, is creating a content calendar. And this doesn't have to be something that is really fancy. It can just be a bulleted list in a Word document. It could be an Excel spreadsheet. It can be a Google Doc. Whatever helps you to stay organized uh, will help to organize and continue your social media program moving forward. Um, and then also, if you are feeling like you've got a good handle on things and you're producing enough content, um, consider using a low-cost automation tool. Steve talked about using Hootsuite. I've used that a lot with a lot of companies that I have worked with. And it really is helpful so that when you do find some time to sit down and maybe you have time to write two or three different social posts one day, but you know that you won't have that time again in the next two weeks, you're able to get it all finished, pre-schedule it, and then it will send it out for you. Um, so those are definitely very helpful tools that are at your availability. Some are free and some are very low cost. And then we also wanted to um, look back at different content and campaign ideas. Um, so Ken and Steve both shared great uh, examples of content that they have been able to share from vendors and partners and industry organizations and media outlets. 
again, all of these different pieces of content can help you to build that reputation online um, and show your authority, your expertise, your likability, everything that you're trying to reach and showcase. We also like to encourage um, posts that humanize your company. Show photos of the people who are working there. Celebrate your employees. Use social media also as a place to recognize them for the work that they're doing, especially if you're able to be open right now and you do have someone out there running the presses. Give them a shout out and thank them for being able to come in and work during this time. Um, Social media is social, it's human. We like to connect, we like to see other people's faces on social media as well. So take that opportunity to share and celebrate your team as well as your customers. I know that some customers do not um, appreciate having their uh, projects or um, other things shared online, but some do. So ask permission, ask customers after you run a job for them if it's something that you can promote for them online. Um, you may be surprised at how many might actually be open to doing that. Another thing that you can consider is offering special incentives to customers who mention a certain social media post. Um, if you are really just trying to, um, you know, increase some sales and gain, gain some new customers, um, that's another great way to um, try and see what happens and if that's something that might be a successful move for you. And lastly, of course, um, have fun. <laughs> Social media is also meant to be fun. It's a great way for you to, again, share about your company and yourself, make it stand out from everybody else out there. And um, people, again, they like fun posts and they like to celebrate things online now more than ever. So um, this is your opportunity to be another resource of uh, fun and positivity online. Uh, so, Denise, I'll give it back over to you. Great. Thanks. Stephanie, Ken, Steve, thank you so much for sharing all of that information today. There was a really a lot of ground that we covered, um, and we do have a number of questions that have come in from the audience. So, um, we'll start getting um, started on some questions. We do have some time. If you still have questions, feel free to use and submit um, some questions now through the Q&A box on your console. Now, one of the questions that came in was, you know, looking at uh, the time we're in right now, we're in, you know, unprecedented times. When do you start marketing on social media? Do you start now in amongst this time that we're now? Do you start it after COVID lifts later on? What do you think is one of the better times to start working on social media and promoting? I can, this is Ken, I can sort of share my views on it. I think everybody, it's, it's a unique question because everybody has a different comfort zone and I think everybody is facing the COVID-19 situation a little differently. I believe if you're not comfortable right now directly promoting your product or service on LinkedIn, sort of edge into the discussion and maybe promote others. I think Steve said it very well, he wants to be a messenger of hope or positivity. Well, if you have a nonprofit or charitable organization that you're working with uh, that's doing great work, market them, uh, highlight what they're doing. And I think what that'll do is they'll start building you as a content distributor. They'll start building your, con your comfort zone rather of what you're putting out there. I saw the other day, um, coming back to Team Concept Printing as an example, they posted something about the work the Salvation Army is doing. And even though it wasn't directly about their wide format work or their fulfillment services, et cetera, it was more about this is another organization that's doing great work. Let's not forget about them. And then I think you just have to edge into it because everybody has to view that differently. Thank you, Mrs. Steve. Thanks, Again. If, if I can for a second, it is a crawl, walk, run model. I think there's no time like mm -hmm. the present to start. I think that if you're not comfortable marketing or educating your clients, just get active. Go out there and follow people. Yeah. Make connections. Um, so you have to start somewhere. So there's no time like the present to take that first step and understand that this is your first foray into social media. It can be intimidating, but nothing happens until you take that first step. Yep. Great, thanks. 
Now, another question that came in is about uh, limit posting to LinkedIn. You mentioned, Ken, I believe that you're only supposed to be posting about 12 times a month. Is there a reason why there's only so many times you should be posting, especially like to the LinkedIn platform? Well, I mean, there's no hard and fast rule. I, I sort of take, I don't want to, I guess, um, desensitize people to what I like to post. I'll just talk from my professional and personal brand. I want to, what I do is, and Steve alluded to this, and so did Stephanie a moment ago, but I like to create a content calendar and cadence, and there's normally four or five different areas that I post on that cadence, and one will be about my organization directly. The next one will be about a client who's doing great work, like Nissan is a very big client and what they're doing. Another one is something about my company's culture, and I think that's a piece we really didn't hit on as much. You can spend a whole week talking about employment branding and winning the war for talent, but talking about your culture. And then the fourth one is a nonprofit or charitable works other people are doing. And then the fifth one is similar to what Steve was saying, the human element. So I like to go into that four or five specific posts in the cadence. And I find that if I do that and I'm, you know, it's not always religious and I'm perfect on it, but if I do that, it normally equals about uh, 12 to maybe 14 at the m most a month. But it's it's all based on your comfort zone. And it is it is something you have to develop a comfort zone with. Very great. Ken. Thank you from so my, much. Yeah, from my perspective on the deep. posting question, yeah, I, I don't want suppliers' brand to turn into white noise. I want to make sure that mm -hmm. we put out good content and educated content. And I think sometimes looking at my feed, there are people that post two to three times a day. In my mind, when I look at my LinkedIn feed, that's white noise. No matter how relevant it may be, it's just noise. And I want to make sure that we're a voice with clarity and we, we're able to cut through that, that noise. Absolutely. Okay, great. And Steve, I have another just, question for you as well. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Ken. Mm -hmm. No, I was just going to say one thing, too, is really quick. It's you also have to understand when your audience wants to take in content. One of my best friends is a construction manager who focuses in the automotive space. They build automotive facilities. Well, his audience on LinkedIn, his network, is really active on Friday, Saturdays, and that's when he posts because he gets a higher engagement rate. So once you get more advanced with this, you'll look at different things of when you're getting higher engagement when you're posting and what you're posting. And that, that's that's probably a, a LinkedIn social media 201 class, but I think that's something you want to consider. Agreed. Thank you, Ken. Um, and Steve, this is something that you probably can touch on. I know you spoke about um, how your employees and have a specific, they have their own brand page, and then um, some a supplier has its own brand company page. Now, do you feel it's more important to share content under a personal brand or a business brand? And then how do you prioritize the two? That's a hard question sometimes, I think. It is very, it's a very, very hard question. And I, I believe in both. Um, if you look at my LinkedIn profile, you see that I, I promote a lot of content out there and I put a lot of stuff in there. The, what I encourage my team members to do is post articles, post content that is aligned with suppliers' marketing strategy. Again, they have their own vo voices, they have their own opinions, they have their own thoughts, but I wanna make sure that we're all rowing in the right direction. Um, as individuals, we need to understand that our personal LinkedIn page is about personal branding. I am very proud to work for Supplier. I think Supplier has a great story to tell. I wanna tell that story in my own voice every chance I get. In regards to supplier posting content, again, we drive it through there, but our primary channel right now is thought leadership coming from the CEO and founder, augmented by thought leadership coming from sales, shared by the corporate website. We are trying to establish that the people that are calling on the clients are thought leaders, and supplier is fortunate to have them as team members. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ken, a question to you about LinkedIn Premium. Is it worth the cost? Because I know that that's an option for a lot of people as they're uh, you know, moving into and looking at LinkedIn. Is it worth the cost to go and take the premium route? 
Yes. I can't answer. Yeah, it, for me it is, for my organization, our, my partners, and uh, for us. And I would say the reason for me is it, al it allows me to look at the engagement rate. It allows me to better connect with my respective audience. And similar to what Steve said earlier, turning leads or relationships into action or, you know, turning a, a suspect into a prospect into a client, it helps me with that. I think if you look at the overall cost of, you know, LinkedIn for what you can get from a branding perspective, it's well worth it. One, one other item, too, that we didn't share on this, there is a platform called Shield. Uh, they're based out of Europe. It's very reasonable. I think it's maybe $20 to $30 a month. But uh, it gives you, it does to LinkedIn what, you know, Moneyball is the baseball. It really gives you, like, your audience when they're on. I'd be remiss if I didn't share the the platform Shield. So it's a really good, that with LinkedIn Premium allows me to get a really good understanding of how impactful we are. Great, awesome. And it looks like we are at the end of our hour and we're just, um, and we're out of time for today. So in behalf of the Impressions Group and RICO, I want to thank you for attending today's webinar. Be sure to check out our webinar page to get information on all of our archives and upcoming webinars. If you take a minute to fill out the brief feedback survey that will appear on your screen next, we would be definitely grateful for that. Your feedback will influence the webinars we bring to you in the future. So I hope to see you again at our next Impressions Group webinar. Thanks again. Thanks, everyone. Have a great